everyone, and welcome to Monday Night Travel with Rick Steves Europe. My name is Julianne Worden, and I will be your moderator this evening as we travel along with Rick. Tonight, we're exploring ye old England, where Rick's name would have been spelled with an E at the end. And now, without further ado, I'll turn things over to Rick Steves, who will be our tour guide this evening. Hi, Rick. Julianne, thank you so much for that nice introduction, and it's great to have you all together. We're going to ye old England, and I won't want to go to go to England until I've had my scrumpy. Scrumpy is hard apple cider, and uh, you know when you go to the pubs in England, you can have a beer, you can have a soft drink, or you can have a cider, and they're quite trendy ciders. And uh, mass-produced ciders are sweet and carbonated and lighter, but this is more tannic. This is more harder. This is more alcoholic. That's for sure. So you got to be careful. And it's very popular in the west of England. We're going to be going there. So this is called scrumpy. Be careful with your scrumpy. I was at a pub in West England once and um, I was having a uh, glass of this and, and the guy there who served to me said, uh, be careful, uh, scrumpy is known for bringing out the violence in people. And I said, I'm a lover, not a fighter. And he said, drink another glass of that and you'll be neither. Okay, so it's a, it's a, it's a strong drink but it's a good drink and it takes me right back to England. Now, we're gonna be also eating and you cannot go to England without having your fish and chips. So I got a good old fashioned fish and chips here. We got a wonderful restaurant in Edmonds where I live called The Market and it's got great seafood. And you'll see in the front there, that little green, that little green blob, that's my mushy peas. Oh baby, you got the mushy peas and that's soaked, boiled and mashed peas. You've also got your white fish that is breaded and then deep fried. You got your French fries and you got some malt vinegar that you want to dribble on your fish and you got a little lemon and it just really is quite a delightful dish. In fact, this has been the working class go-to plate in England for about 150 years. The first fish and chips places hit the scene in the 1860s. By the middle of the 20th century, there were over 30,000 fish and chip places in England. Now there's less than 10,000 because there's other alternatives for simple, fast, go to take out food. A lot of Chinese restaurants are competing with the fish and chip shops, but you gotta have a fish and chips when you're in England. And that's what I'll be munching on tonight. Now we're gonna go all around England. And we, when we put these little programs together on Monday night travel, we go to Classroom Europe and we cobble them together and Gabe Gunnick is on our Monday night travel team. And he was a teacher before he came to us and he's still a teacher at heart. And it's so great to have Gabe on our team because he goes into Monday, in the classroom Europe and he puts together these playlists and then he makes lesson plans for teachers. And Gabe can, Julian, let's get Gabe up here. And hey Gabe, can yeah. you just explain to people what you do? Because it's a cool tool for teachers and we are just such big fans of teachers. We think teachers are, the unsung heroes really in our society. We need to support them. And Classroom Europe is our gift to teachers. And it's our hope that they can use these clips, cobble them together, and also with your help, make something that helps them teach kids about how wonderful the other 96% of humanity is, the other 96% of the people on this planet that don't live in our country. What, what do you got there, Gabe? Exactly. So um, thank you for letting me pop in from behind the scenes tonight. And I used to be a high school Spanish teacher back when I lived in Grand Rapids, Michigan. So I know firsthand how hard teachers work and we are very grateful for them. Um, when I was a teacher, I loved making lesson plans. And so I figured why not make some lesson plans for some, uh, through Classroom Europe um, for our teachers. Um, so I will show you how to find those. If you go to ricksteves.com right here um, and you just scroll down you to the widget with Rick holding the apple, that is where you can go to Classroom Europe. Then if you look in the upper right-hand corner, you see a link for public playlists. You'll find some playlists that have been created by Rick Steves Europe staffers like myself, and some playlists that were created by other teachers out there still in the classroom. Um, there's a nice search feature. So you could search, for example, for Monday night, and you'll see all of the Monday night travel videos. I, whenever we use a Classroom Europe playlist in Monday night travel, um, I post the playlist. The ones with red banners have lesson plans. And additionally, if you wanted to search for my name, you can find all of the playlists that I've created 
um, including at least a dozen that have recommended lesson plans. For example, here we have tonight's show, Monday Night Travel, Yield England. The red banner tells us that it has a lesson plan. If we click, we see a description. We see the rundown of the playlist with all the clips. And then we have our lesson plan. So there's about a dozen response questions for students to answer while they watch. We have about five discussion prompts for class discussions afterwards for good meaty discussion. Um, and then we have some project ideas. Um, so a good jumping off point for teachers and they can include whatever they want. I also know that we have a group joining with uh, joining us tonight that has enjoyed Rick's resources in their classroom and is using that lesson plan tomorrow. Um, and that is Miss Hope's English class um, from the USADA school in Weston, Florida. Um, so that's a group of international students learning English, students from around the world. And we want to welcome them, welcome them here with us tonight, especially as we explore the place where the English language got its start. So that's a bit about my work with Classroom Europe, um, and I'm going to turn it back to you, Rick. All right. Thank you, Gabe. And that's just a labor of love on your part, and it, it empowers teachers to do a better job, teachers who want to broaden their students' horizon, like Mrs. Hope in Florida. We're going to kick off our Ye Old England with Cambridge and Oxford. England has two venerable university towns, and there's a long standing dispute over which one's the best from an educational point of view. We're going to talk about which one's the best from a tourism point of view. When you're traveling around England, if you got less than a month, you should not do them both. Choose one or the other and then make time for something entirely different. I specifically went to Cambridge and Oxford on the same trip when I scouted our TV show, and then I went back with the crew in order to give you these two clips so you can look at Cambridge and Oxford side by side and think which one you want to go to. In fact, we're going to do a little poll after you watch both of these. So be thinking which one would be most fun for me. I'm going to take us right now to uh, England, and we're going to start off with Cambridge. So thanks for joining us. And now let's go to Cambridge. Cambridge is famous for its prestigious university, and it's the epitome of a university town with stately colleges and distinguished alumni ranging from Isaac Newton to Prince Charles. Proud locals love to say, DNA was first modeled just over there. The electron was discovered in that very lab. And the atom was first split just up there. The university dominates and owns most of Cambridge, a historic town of about 120,000 people. It's compact and everything's within a pleasant walk. The town's built along the sleepy Cam River, which is lined with esteemed colleges. And fronting the colleges is the main street with most of the commercial energy. As you stroll, notice how peaceful the town is. Lots of bikes weaving through lots of pedestrians. Your sightseeing revolves around the school, its traditions and quirky spirit. For example, this clock was unveiled by the late Cambridge physicist Stephen Hawking. The grotesque grasshopper that relentlessly pulls time forward periodically winks at passers-by. The message, time is passing, so live every moment to the fullest. England's greatest universities, Oxford and Cambridge, have been rivals since the 1300s. We'll visit Oxford later. Each has the same basic heritage and design. No main campus. Instead, the many colleges are scattered throughout the charming town center. By catching one of the many guided town walks, you'll get an insider's look at an urban mix of what locals call town and gown. In medieval Europe, it was the church that was in charge of higher education. And here in Cambridge, we have 31 colleges, all with the same design. You have a beautiful green court. Set around the court are buildings where the students eat, sleep, pray and study. Many colleges welcome the public to browse around. At their historic front gates, you'll find a porter's lodge. The porter delivers mail, monitors who comes and goes, and keeps people off the grass. Colleges have centuries of heritage, and you feel that in their exquisite libraries. Here in Corpus Christi's Parker Library, that college's literary treasures are proudly on display, such as letters from Anne Boleyn before husband Henry VIII flopped off her head. This was an amazing book. It was, a, it was a binder that had handwritten letters from famous people to famous people that were from the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. And it was right there for us to look at. 
Newton's groundbreaking treatise, Principia Mathematica. The exclusive putting green quality of the courtyard lawns is a huge deal here. Generally, only senior professors can walk on the courts, the centerpiece of each college campus. One of the powerhouse colleges at Cambridge is King's, which has a central courtyard to match its esteemed reputation. The 500-year-old King's College Chapel, built by Henry's six through eight, is England's best surviving example of late Gothic architecture. With its emphasis on vertical lines, it's called perpendicular Gothic. This is the most impressive building in Cambridge, with the largest single span of vaulted roof anywhere. 2,000 tons of glorious fan vaulting. Mm. Here you can enjoy the most complete collection of original 16th century Renaissance stained glass in existence. With the help of this closed captioning, handy if you can read Latin, you can wander through the entire Bible. And the Adoration of the Magi, a masterpiece by Rubens, adorns the altar. Mm. Trinity College, just next door, was founded in 1546 by Henry VIII. It's, it's amazing, all of these amazing colleges that on their own would be worth a, visit, uh, a trip are gathered together in one town and you can visit almost all of them and each one welcomes you. It's got its own little museum, it's got its own heritage, beautiful architecture, wonderful gardens, the richest and biggest in town. Cambridge has produced nearly a hundred Nobel Prize winners, and about a third of them were Trinity graduates. The great mathematician, Sir Isaac Newton, who both studied and taught at Trinity, famously clapped his hands and timed the echo to calculate the speed of sound. This is a great trick, and you can show off with your kids for this, and it'll blow them away. Check this out. Huh, 1120 feet per second or 761 miles per hour at this altitude. The colleges that face the Cam River each have garden-like backyards that combine to make the riverbank feel like a lush and exclusive park. A beloved Cambridge tradition is a romantic and graceful glide past these colleges in a traditional flat-bottom punt. Skilled locals make the ride look effortless. So this is uh, Trinity College and this is the Wren Library. You can hire a boat to enjoy a witty narration by a student as you're pulled past fine college architecture. Yeah, these are called the backs, the backs of the river. There's eight colleges along the river. And so this area is called the backs because quite simply it's the back of those colleges. The only way you can see the backs of these colleges is along the river. So the best way to see the backs of all the colleges is by punting. So imagine the delight of sitting in a, in a beautiful little romantic punt and having a local student who's so witty and so well-spoken and loves his history tell you the whole story as you glide by all these amazing buildings. You do that and it's elegant and it's graceful and you feel so cool. And then you think, I'm gonna rent one myself. And then you feel like a real idiot. Uh, it's tough to do it on your own, I'll tell you that, because I have tried and I've tried and I've tried. Or for a little levity and probably more exercise than you really want, why not rent one yourself? <laughs> The punts are tougher to maneuver than they look. Okay, now we're gonna go from Cambridge, we're gonna go over to Oxford. And I'll just make a quick little reminder here. If you're a train type person like me, the default is take the train. In England, like many countries, you'll go through the main capital, the hub. So if Oxford is here and Cambridge is here, and you wanna go from one to the other, you go down to London, and then back out on another train. And London is so big, it's got train stations around its perimeter. So you got four or five train stations, you'll get into town and very likely have to take the subway to the other train station. It's a mess when you can take a bus direct from A to B or Oxford to Cambridge or Cambridge to Oxford. And I uh, went to the tourist office in Cambridge and I said, is there a bus that goes direct to Oxford? They said, well, sure there is. It cost six pounds, it's like $10 and it leaves twice a day, once in the morning, once in the afternoon, it takes three hours. Wow, great, great tip. Beautiful, relaxing ride through different towns, uh, wonderful countryside, and effortlessly from downtown to downtown. So now we're gonna go to Oxford and you get to compare the two university towns. 
Oxford, founded in the 10th century, is home to the oldest university in the English-speaking world. Its university was born back in the early Middle Ages, and ever since the first homework was assigned, the University of Oxford's graduates have helped to shape Western civilization. It brags that its teachers and alumni include a couple dozen prime ministers, over 50 Nobel Prize winners, and nearly a dozen saints. Today, it's a thriving town of 160,000, part industry, part university, and part bedroom community for Londoners. It's a lively town, filled with fun and energy during both the academic term when you'll see students everywhere, or during summer break, we're here in July, when tourists outnumber the students. Like in Cambridge, the river is filled with tourists, still working on their punting skills. Oxford's main drag, <laughs> High Street, is lined with both shops and colleges. Again, it's a mix that illustrates that town-gown division. There's been a tension between the privileged university population and the hardscrabble regular people of Oxford for over 800 years. In fact, it was a town gown spat back in 1209 that drove a group of professors and students out of Oxford and to the more welcoming town of Cambridge, where they helped to found that rival university. The historic heart of Oxford University is its old school quad. In the courtyard of its main library, the quad is surrounded by the university's first set of purpose-built classrooms, each marked with the original curriculum, metaphysics, astronomy, music, moral philosophy, and so on. Oxford, like Cambridge, is designed on the collegiate system. While each of the many colleges nurtures its students in its own way, the university provides the curriculum. And while students live and study and are mentored in their respective colleges, it's here in the university buildings that they go to class, are tested, and enjoy the great ceremonial events that come with being a student at Oxford. To imagine studying here in the 1400s, pop into the Divinity School to see the university's first formal classroom. Here, under this impressive fan-vaulted ceiling, the mission of higher education was particularly respected. Upstairs is Duke Humphrey's library. In those days, libraries were placed above classrooms for maximum sunlight and minimum moisture. It's a world of books dating back to the Middle Ages, stacked neatly under a painted wooden ceiling. Books were considered so precious that many were actually chained to the desk. Of course, there are plenty of modern buildings too. In a wing of the university's fabled Bodleian Library, visitors are free to peruse its treasures gallery, a literary treasure chest celebrating the genius of Oxford over the centuries. So right in this little room, you saw it there, you're gonna see Shakespeare's portfolio, you're gonna see Handel's Messiah, a copy of the Magna Carta, all right there in that small, free little gallery in the library. And each school, depending on how powerful it was in the old days, I suppose, has small museums and small treasures rooms in the library that really are impressive. Of course, the big museums and the big galleries and the big treasures rooms are in London. But when you're in Oxford and when you're in Cambridge, be sure to do that sightseeing because the sights are marvelous. You'll see a Shakespeare first folio, 18 plays from 1623 an original score of Handel's Messiah, written in 1741, a copy of the Magna Carta from 1217, when King John was forced to grant his nobility certain rights, opening the door to democracy. It seems this copy was nibbled on by a mouse. Fancy meal. Across the street is the Museum of the History of Science. It's filled with scientific equipment that the scholars of Oxford used to change our world. There's chemistry, the 18th century boom in the study of oxygen and other gases. Medicine, after 1850, anesthetics and antiseptics made major surgery more survivable. Microscopes helped scholars observe and tell then unseen worlds. Science enjoyed the support of England's royalty. King George III had his own ornate microscope made of silver in 1770. And Einstein's chalkboard still features his hand-scrawled equations from 1931. Obviously, from the last four lines, the universe is expanding. 
Like at Cambridge, you can visit many of Oxford's colleges. Modlin College, where C.S. Lewis taught, is the prettiest. Established in 1458, its cloister is a monastic-feeling square ringed by the dining hall, chapel, and student dorms. The grounds are meticulously kept, as if to inspire Modlin students to excellence. Christ Church is Oxford's grandest college with the most esteemed list of alumni. It was founded by King Henry VIII back in the 16th century on the site of an old monastery. While it still has a close connection with the royal family, it's most popular these days because scenes from the Harry Potter movies were filmed here. Harry Potter fans love the dining hall. The Grand Hall, with its splendid hammer beam ceiling, is ringed with portraits of alumni gazing down, as if wondering, who's Harry Potter? <laughs> Oxford or Cambridge? That's the question. I'd see just one or the other and save time for something entirely different on your itinerary. Both are about an hour from London. Cambridge may be more charming with its river and gardens. Oxford is more substantial with more to see and do. One plus for Oxford, it's on the way to our next stop, Blenheim Palace. And we're not going to Blenheim Palace, but I should remind you, you can watch the entire show of any of these shows by going to ricksteves.com and into the TV section, because there we've got 150 of our programs, everything we've ever produced. You can watch it for free anytime you like. So there's about four or five different shows that we've pulled from to make this presentation this evening. Hey, I'm cleaning up my plate, my beautiful fish and chips. I'm loving it. And I'm going to remind you when I'm all done with that, it's time for dessert. And I'm going to go with a very traditional English dessert. And this, my friends, is spotted dick okay and <laughs> spotted dick is um well i'll tell you where it got the name a little while ago but i don't just go for any spotted dick this is auntie's spotted dick okay and uh, it's a traditional english dessert uh dick was the word for dessert or pudding back in the victorian times and it's spotted because it's filled with beautiful little raisins and uh it's a uh, you'll see it on menus and a lot of people get a little bit stirred up by what? What did I did I read that correctly? Uh, in the House of Lords, a very very conservative place, you know, in the Parliament of England, um, they actually on the menu they changed it because they didn't want to upset people, and they call it Spotted Richard. But uh, right here we call it Spotted Dick. All right, hey, um, Julianne, we were going to do a, a survey about Oxford and Cambridge. And I imagine you've got a survey all put together that our travelers can vote on. I am very curious if you had, this is not where you wanna study. This is where you wanna travel. You only wanna to go to one if you got less than a month in England because you wanna save up time for something different. Each of them has their pros and cons. Go ahead and tick your favorite. And in a moment, we'll know which one's the most popular. Would you go with your travel and loved ones to Cambridge or to Oxford? And uh, I'll let you wrestle with that for a minute as we go to our next little clip. And I want to remind you, when you travel, you want to try different things. You want to try stuff you've never been done before. I had never had snuff, snuff tobacco, you know? And I met a guy in, uh, in Germany. He was the great, 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 great grandson of Johannes Kepler, so he said. And I was sitting there having a drink with him on the Danube River. And he told me, have some snuff. And I didn't know how to do it. He said, well, you pour it onto your anatomical snuff box. If you pull your thumb back, you create a little dish right here. Boop, 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 boop. That's your anatomical snuff box. You do that. And then woo, you get all this. I've never smoked cigarettes. I don't know what a tobacco nicotine buzz is or anything like that. But I know what a snuff nose buzz is. And you're going to see that right now. This is a, my favorite little, one of my favorite little pubs in Bath where we get to try some snuff. We're getting out of our comfort zone. We're trying new things. You don't need to like it, but you got to try it once. Here we go. Yeah, I can do the so, yeah. Hi, I'm Rick Steves. I'm in Bath in a, in a beautiful little pub called The Star. And this is Ed. Hey, Hi, Ed. And, and Ed, this, this pub's known for great beer, great ambience, no noise, no music, just good, good conversation. And, and also for snuff. 
And Ed, can you just give me a little pinch of that snuff? Because I understand this is the anatomical snuff box right there. Have you ever heard that term, the anatomical snuff box? Um, I haven't. No, see, see, I made the anatomical snuff box. Oh, I see, you made the anatomical snuff box. Yes, no. The German taught me that. Perfect. So now what do I do? I just take a snuff? Take a snuff. Like that? Puff it up your nose. Whoa, and that just makes yep. you a little tingle. Absolutely. Wow. And then we give you one of these, oh, just in case you need to uh, oh, good. sort yourself out afterwards. Okay. Now, is it is it rude for somebody else to take a sniff also? Uh, no, can do. Can Ready? you do it? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> makes you giggle. Thank you very much. It does. <laughs> it's, good, a it's good snuff. It just, oh. Well, you know, it's new stuff for travel, and that's what I like about travel. Ed, thanks. And, and the name of this Thank pub you. is? The Star. The Star. The most convivial pub in Bath. I'm quite generous. I gave Ed a little bit of his own snuff. <laughs> hey, that was a good experience. And I was working there. See, I have to go back to all these places every time I go to town to update my book. And the Star Pub is in my book. It's been in my book for years. Everything we did in Oxford, everything we did in Cambridge, it's in my book. In fact, everything in these scripts comes right out of my book. I take, I literally take the chapters from the book put it into one giant Word doc, and I just carve away at it until there's 3,000 words left. And that's a half hour TV show. Hey, Julianne, do we have our results from our um, survey? Yes, let me share them here. Oh my goodness, it's a close one. Look mm -hmm. at that, 54. Do you, do you think this uh, election is fair and, and, uh, and uh, honest? It's very close. I know that a lot of people are fans of the show Inspector Morse that's set in Oxford, so that might have swayed it in uh, that direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, because I would have thought the punting would have made people go to Cambridge, but yeah. yeah. Well, that's very interesting. It's, it's, it is a split decision almost, but I think I can understand why 54% would go with Oxford. Mm -hmm. Hey, thank you very much. Although, all the way, uh, by the way, it's um, Christmas uh, sales season. We got our Christmas sale on right now at ricksteves.com. If you go into our web store, everything is 20 to 50% off. And something that you might find really interesting is our 2022 calendars. We work very hard for the leading calendar producer in the country, I understand, Workman, and they love our calendars. They sell really well. And we tie in all of our love of Europe, our favorite photographs, our little special tips. And they're just a lot of fun. There's the day by day you put on your desk or there's the wall hanging calendar hanging on your desk. But these are available now for 2022 and they are 30% off. Here's a quick little ad. So you might want to go to our website and check that out. <laughs> snuff, snuff, snuff. Hey, I'm Rick Steves, and I am really excited about our new calendars. We've got our 2022 calendars just in, and there's two kinds. There's the hang on the wall version, and we've got the page a day. The cool thing about this page a day calendar, check this out. Every day is a beautiful photograph with a clever little insight about that place and practical tips based on a lifetime of traveling and loving Europe. And the hang on the wall calendar is fun because each month features a different region. In March, it'll be Sicily. Uh, in July, it would be Tuscany. And in August, it would be Iceland. So many glaciers, so many waterfalls, so many travel experiences waiting for you to enjoy. Hey, in 2022, I would love to be your travel partner, and I'd love to help you stoke your travel dreams with these calendars. Pick them up wherever you buy books. Happy travels, and thanks a lot. All right. Hey, well, now we're going to go to Dartmoor. But before I do, I just want to remind everybody that Monday Night Travel cannot happen without our wonderful crew. We happen to be a travel company. Therefore, our staff travels a lot. We got four of us on our crew right now, and half of us are overseas. Ben is studying in St. Petersburg, and Lisa is on our Turkey tour. Every winter, we like to get our guides together on a tour and let them know what it's like to be on a tour so our guides can empathize with all of you when you take our tours to know what it's like to be on the receiving end of all of their hard work. So right now, we've got a bus load. We've got 20 or 25 guides on a bus in Turkey doing our best of Turkey tour, and Lisa is with them having a great time, I am sure. That leaves Julianne and Gabe back home just looking at all of their little social media posts and trying to keep a good attitude. And I'm so glad that Julianne is able to help us out and Gabe right now behind the scenes answering your questions. I wanna remind you, we're gonna do Q and A in a few more minutes. So if you got any questions, be sure you ask them now. And now it's time to go to Dartmoor. And this is in the South of England 
And, you know, I just want to call your attention to the weather of England. And when I'm filming in England, it's quite stressful because I have no control over the weather, whether it can get socked in. I literally, I allocate more days for a shoot when I'm in England. Uh, and um, it, it, you know, if I can just get a couple of hours of sunshine, we can really make it look sunnier than it actually is. We're a little deceptive that way. But in Dartmoor, we were blessed with beautiful weather. And this gives our camera person a chance to capture the light. If you ask a cameraman, what do they do? They're chasing the light. When you talk to a film crew, they go, oh, it's beautiful light. Look at the light. In this next show, in this next clip, you can look at what we refer to when we say the light is magnificent. We're in Dartmoor now, in the south of England. A short drive further north takes us out of Cornwall and into the neighboring county of Devon, where we venture into remote and windswept Dartmoor. Perched on the edge of the moor, the tiny town of Chagford is an easy home base for exploring Dartmoor. The small town atmosphere here makes you feel like you've stepped into a time warp. It has a classic English village feel, with a picturesque church and cemetery, and cozy pubs that double as inns for hikers to spend the night. One of England's most popular national parks, Dartmoor is one of the few truly wild places left in this densely populated country. A moor is characterized by open land with scrubby vegetation. England's moors are vast medieval commons, rare places where all can pass, anyone can graze their livestock, and, in the case of Dartmoor, ponies run wild. Mm. Dartmoor sits on a granite plateau, and occasionally, bare granite peaks called tors break through the heather. Rising like lonesome watchtowers, these distinctive landmarks are the goal of popular hikes. Haytor is the most famous of these rocks. For the tenderfoot, the climb to its summit can be a challenge. It's not El Capitan, but it's hard to beat that king of the mountain feeling and the rewarding views that come with it. A well-planned walk through the moors rewards day hikers with vivid memories. Stone slab clapper bridges, some medieval and some even ancient, remind hikers that for thousands of years, humans have trod these same paths and forded these same streams. So I wanna remind you, every little bridge, every little rock, every little climb we see here, it's on the map. It's in the little books. Uh, you can buy the little books at any cafe or gift store. You can buy the maps anywhere. Get a good ordnance survey map and study it. Know what you wanna see. That's what I do, and I, I distill it into a chapter in my book, or I get all the uh, little tips to put together for a TV show. But all that stuff, it's not rocket science. It's right there on the map, and you just got to do your homework. Tall stones guided early travelers. This one, erected by pagans long before Christianity arrived, was later carved into a cross. The iconic ponies of Dartmoor run wild. Their ancestors were the working horses of the local miners. Living in the harsh conditions of the moor, these ponies are a hardy breed, known for their stamina. Wow, boy, and there's light. I'll never forget, we were watching these horses gallop along the horizon. And Simon said, Rick, walk up there. And I thought, well, what do you, what do you mean? Why, why would I do that? And then I did this and it really turned into one of the nicest little clips I think we've ever shot. I'm so thankful that my producer Simon said, Rick, walk up there. Today, they're beloved among hikers for the romance they bring to the otherwise stark terrain. Of the hundreds of Neolithic ruins that dot the Dartmoor landscape, the Scoral Stone Circle is my favorite. In fact, this is the place where I became a travel writer. When I was a kid traveling around England, I stayed in a youth hostel a short hike from here, and I went out all alone one day, and I found this stone circle. And it just occurred to me, everybody's crowded in to see Stonehenge, and I'm here surrounded by this mystical wonderland. And I just thought as I was writing this up, somebody needs to find these places and bring them home so other Americans can find them on their trips. <laughs> and I just decided to be a travel writer back then. I'm so glad I did. Panquil and Nearly Forgotten, erected some 4,000 years ago by mysterious people for mysterious reasons, it's yours alone, the way a stone circle should be. It's just you and your imagination. Enjoy the quiet. Ponder the 40 centuries of people who've made this enchanting landscape their home 
and the wisdom of today's English to protect it and keep it pristine. Okay, now we're going to go to the most charming, quaint, thatch happy little corner of England, the Cotswold Villages, two hours west of London, really a highlight when you go to England. Two hours west of London, so easy to get to, so rewarding. What a wonderful contrast to London. The Cotswold Hills are dotted with enchanting villages and bucolic farmland, and it's all laced together by wonderful trails. This is the quintessential English countryside, and it's walking country. And I'll tell you, you gotta make a point to take a walk. It took me years to figure that out. I would drive and see things from the towns, and then I realized, no, no, no. You gotta walk from town to town. Take a taxi to one town and then walk back between the roads so you're behind the castles, behind the mansions, all alone in the wilderness. Um, remember, the, the latitude is really high here. This is Calgary, like in Alberta. That, it's that far north. And that means it's light until 10 or 11 o'clock. You can have dinner and take a walk for a couple of hours after dinner, and it won't even cut into the rest of your sightseeing. But one way or another, get off the roads and walk for a few hours in the Cotswolds. The Cotswolds are best appreciated on foot, and that's how we'll tour the area. The region's made to order for tender feet. You'll encounter time-past villages, delightful vistas, and poetic moments you'll discover hidden stone bridges, cut across fancy front yards, and enjoy close encounters with lots of sheep. The English love their walks and defend their age-old right to free passage. And they organize to assure that landowners respect this law too. Any paths found blocked are unceremoniously unblocked. While landlords have plenty of fences, they provide plenty of gates as well. You'll encounter all sorts of gates on these hikes. This one's called a kissing gate. It works better with two. Lower Slaughter is a classic example of a Cotswold village with a babbling brook, charming gardens, and a working water mill. Just above the mill, a delightful cafe overlooks the mill pond. As with many fairy tale regions in Europe, the present day beauty of the Cotswolds was the result of an economic disaster. Wool was a huge industry in medieval England, and Cotswold sheep grew the very best. According to a 12th century saying, in Europe, the best wool is English. And in England, the best wool is Cotswold. It's a story of boom and bust, and then boom again. Because of its wool, the region prospered. Wealthy wool merchants built fine homes of the honey-colored local limestone. Thankful to God for the riches their sheep brought, they built oversized churches nicknamed wool cathedrals. But with the rise of cotton and the Industrial Revolution, the region's wool industry collapsed. The fine Cotswold towns fell into a depressed time warp, becoming sleeping beauties. Because of that, the region has a rustic charm. And that's the basis of today's new prosperity. Its residents are catering to lots of tourists, and the Cotswolds have become a popular escape for Londoners, people who can afford thatched mansions like these. In England, Main Street is called the High Street, and in Cotswold market towns, High Street was built wide, designed to handle thousands of sheep on market days. The handsome market town of Chipping Campton has a high street that's changed little over the centuries. Everything you see was made of the same finely worked Cotswold stone, the only stone allowed today. Roofs still use the traditional stone shingles. To make the weight easier to bear, smaller and lighter slabs are higher up. A 17th century market hall with its original stonework from top to bottom intact marks the town center. Hikers admire the surviving medieval workmanship. You can imagine centuries of wheelings and dealings that took place under these fairy rafters. Continuing our walk, we come to the quaint village of Stanton. 
travel writers tend to overuse the word quaint. I save it for here in the Cotswolds. A strict building code keeps towns looking what many locals call overly quaint. Village churches welcome walkers to pop in and enjoy a thoughtful break. So this is a good example of how if you know how to look, you can turn a nondescript site into a wonder, a highlight of your day. We're stepping into this little church here in Stanton, and uh, we're just going to look at small details. But you could look at an, an historic church in any little town and find these same details. But just check out this next minute or so and see what lurks behind the doors when you are a thoughtful sightseer. This church probably sits upon an ancient pagan site. How do we know? It's dedicated to St. Michael. And Michael, the archangel who fought the devil, still guards the door. Inside, you get a sense that this church has comforted this community in good times and bad. Pre-Christian symbols decorate the columns, perhaps left over from those pagan days. And the list of rectors goes way back, without a break, to the year 1269. This church was built with wool money. In fact, they say generations of sheep dog leashes actually wore these grooves. I guess a shepherd took his dog everywhere, even to church. While not quite in a noble mansion, we're sleeping plenty comfortably just down the road in the village of Stow on the Wold. Stowe mixes medieval charm with a workaday reality. A selection of traditional pubs, cute shops, and inviting cafes ring its busy square. For centuries, the square hosted a huge wool market. The historic market cross stood tall, reminding all Christian merchants to trade fairly under the sight of God. And stocks like these were handy when a scoundrel deserved a little public ridicule. People came from as far away as Italy to buy the prized Cotswold wool fleeces. You can imagine, with 20,000 sheep sold on a single day, it was a thriving scene. The sheep would be paraded into the market down narrow fleece alleys like this. They were built really narrow because it forced the sheep to go single file so they could count them as they entered the market. Okay, now we're going to have some scrumpy. I'm going to finish my scrumpy right here. This is such good, tasty stuff. And I do want to remind you, when you're in England, you can look for scrumpy. We're going to go to a scrumpy farm right now. It's an apple orchard, a guy named Roger Wilkins. And he's been in my book for probably 20 years. And I always think I'm going to go back next time and he's going to be retired or he's not going to be well. He's pickled. He hasn't changed for a, a bit in the last decade. And we're going to drop in on Roger. He's always got a party going right there in his place. And we're going to learn about real, honest to goodness, scrumpy. Hi, I'm Rick Steves, and I'm here with my friend Roger Wilkins. Hey, Roger. Hello, I'm Roger Wilkins. And we're making scrumpy. This is cider. This is old-fashioned cider. This is proper scrumpy. This is how it used to be made years ago. Pure, pure, pure fermented apple juice. And your apple orchard is up the, there? The apple orchard is up there. We make the grow all our own apples, but I do take some off from local farmers. Yeah. And uh, everything is made as pure as and no added colorings, no preservatives. So let's go have a little uh, drink. And what is very cool about this is, this is this is a traditional cider, not your mass-produced cider. No, no. Every time I drop in to see uh, Roger, he's got, it's like a party. There's, he's just an impromptu pub. And everybody from the nearby towns, all the kids, all the young guys come out there. And it's just a constant scene enjoying this old fashioned pure cider. Proper traditional. Because if it's mass produced, it's got chemicals yes, and so on. Yes, yes. And this is scrumpy. And I'd, I'd like you, we got all your friends here, I'd like you to just pull me out a nice glass of dry scrumpy. Here we go. Now, how did you learn how to make this scrumpy? I learned everything from my grandfather. Is that right? Yeah. He, he learned me and told me all about cider making. I've drunk cider ever since I was four or five years of age. And if, if your grandpa drank this cider, he would be okay with it? Yes. 
He would be okay. Four topics of that. No yeah, and that's good stuff. Yes. Well, let's hope that we can have good, solid, scrumpy for all of your friends for a long time to come. Roger Wilkins. Agricultural wine. <laughs> right, Roger. There you go. And uh, he, this is the kind of guy I just love to find because he's going to be there. He loves his work. He's found his niche. And if you can drive up that little winding lane, you've got yourself an amazing experience. And these are the kind of experiences that distinguish your trip. These are the kind of places I look for. I look for, and so does my entire staff when we make our guidebooks. Hey, it's time right now to play Where's Rick? And this is our uh, little game where we take the teases, the openings of our show, and we guess where we are. And with each open of a show, I have this little bit where I go, hey, I'm Rick Steves, back with more of the best year. If this time we're doing this, that, and that, and that, because we are in. And then we reveal, we didn't say the name of the place. And it's kind of a drinking game, I think you could say. We'll pause. You can guess where we are. If you get it wrong, you got to take a drink. And if you get it right, you can take a drink also. Agriculture <laughs> wine. Hi, I'm Rick Steves, back with more of the best of Europe. This time, we're navigating the Adriatic and a lot more. All right, this is Marco Polo's home. He lived here. This is a little miniature version of Dubrovnik. This is on the Dalmatian coast. Where could we be? It's Croatia. Thanks for joining us. Nice. Hi, I'm Rick Steves, back with more travels. This time, we're venturing east of Europe. I said travels because we're not in Europe. And with the help of a lot of hot air, we're experiencing the breathtaking best of... I'm actually in a balloon right now. I mean, once you get up in a balloon, you realize how comfortable, you, you realize how much mass there is in air. I've been in a balloon twice in my life and it's both been right here. And it is really a delightful place to have that experience. Cappadocia, Anatolia. Central Turkey. Central Thanks Turkey. Thanks for joining us. All right. Hi, I'm Rick Steves, back with more travels. This time we're venturing beyond Europe. I'm wearing my yarmulke, and I'm ready to learn. This... We've got a whole half hour show in this amazing country. What a beautiful place to check out. ...is the best of Israel. Thanks for joining us. And if you're going to go there, you got to go here. Hi, I'm Rick Steves, back with more travels. This time, we're venturing beyond Europe, delving into the Muslim and Arab half of the Holy Land. This is... Every wall has two sides. You got to talk to people on both sides if you've really been there. Palestine. Our goal? To walk in the footsteps of the people who live here. Thanks for joining us. And there's a whole half hour show on just that. Hi, I'm Rick Steves, back with more of the best of Europe. As always, we're sampling the local culture. And around here, that means great beer. Pilsner Urquil, the best year beer in Europe. Oh, baby. We're in Prague in the yeah. Czech Republic. Thanks for joining us. All right. You know, everybody does the same route from London kind of circling north between there and Wales and Edinburgh. The south of England has a lot to offer and it usually gets skipped over. So if you've done England and you want more, consider the south. We're going to go to part of the south right here, but go to our website and check out our itinerary for the south of England and you can see what you could do on your own, even if you don't want to take one of our tours. But enough war history, let's hit the beach. Brighton is South England's Coney Island. Britain's royalty helped establish Brighton as a resort back around 1800 when Napoleon's wars shut down vacation travel on the continent. King George IV chose Brighton to build a vacation palace for himself and royal followers began a frenzy of construction along the nearby seashore. Soon, this once sleepy seaside village was transformed into an elegant resort town. In 1840, the train connected London with Brighton. Suddenly, these beaches were accessible to the working class masses, and Brighton has been London by the sea ever since. Two landmarks line the promenade, 
the latest eye-catcher is a futuristic observation tower. But the big draw remains its pleasure pier. Built in 1899 and jutting far into the water, it gave everyone a chance to enjoy the sea. Glittering and loaded with amusements, Brighton Pier is the place to go for a fix of junk food, including some candy floss, that's cotton candy, and to survive dizzying rides. If you can ignore the garish arcade games, you might be able to imagine yourself as a Victorian Londoner out on holiday. Just a couple blocks from the People's Pier was the King's Palace. Brighton's Royal Pavilion, with its eccentric exterior, recalls the city's flamboyant heyday. Its interior, which retains its 1820s decor, is even more outlandish. As a prince, the man who would become England's King George IV was lively, decadent, and trendsetting. He loved to vacation by the sea and host glamorous parties. George was enamored with Asian cultures, styling his vacation home with exotic decorations from the Far East. Music was a passion of the king. In the music room, the royal band gave concerts and serenaded high society guests as they danced under Chinese-inspired decor. The king's other passion? Hosting elaborate dinners. His king-sized kitchen was one of the most innovative of its time. The huge rotisserie could cook enough meat to feed a hundred hungry guests. Here in the banqueting room, the table set for dessert. Imagine England's pre-Victorian elite munching cream cakes and sipping liqueurs under the extravagant, dragon-powered chandelier. You can imagine, King George was an extravagant spender, and he left piles of debt. Shortly after his death, his niece, Victoria, took the throne. Queen Victoria wanted more privacy and less decadence, so she sold the pavilion to the city of Brighton, which owns it to this day. After visiting a resort town, England's natural beauty provides a delightful contrast. These chalk cliffs are often mistaken for Dover's, but they're the white cliffs of Beachy Head. Same chalk, same coastline, but further west. Beachy Head is carpeted by a vast grassy field, wild yet smooth as a putting green, reaching up to a dramatic drop-off. With the open sea beyond and white chalk cliffs plummeting 500 feet into the surf, this scene thrills hikers. From here, a long undulating series of cliffs stretches for miles. Long ago, these were dubbed the Seven Sisters by groggy sailors at sea who gazed lustily through the mist from their ships and imagined a can-can of seven maidens lifting their lacy petticoats. While this chalk may have looked like lace, from a distance, in the fog, in a drunken stupor, it's actually the shelly sediment of the seabed, solidified over a hundred million years and then raised high by the slow motion collision of continents. The handy hamlet of Burling Gap has an inviting visitor center. Its stairway provides the only convenient access to the beach. Early birds get the sandy spots among the pebbles and the tide pools are a hit with the kids. Beachy Head is just one stretch of the South Downs Way, one of many beloved public walks that crisscross Britain. The English love to ramble and enjoy historic points along the way. Around here, as this mysterious horse illustrates, art has been carved into the underlying chalk of the hillsides for generations. Towering figures, like the Long Man of Wilmington, go back many centuries. The countryside feels made to order for easy walks. After Rhonda, we want... Okay, so now I want to remind you what we just were. South Downs is one of many great hikes in England. We've seen a few of them. Dartmoor, Cotswolds, South Downs, beautiful hikes in Wales, beautiful hike across England, the North Hadrian's Wall, beautiful hikes in Cornwall. Lots of great opportunities to walk, and the English love their walks. If you love your sunshine and you want Britain, go to the south of Spain. There's a big rock called Gibraltar, and the British own it. Let's go now to the Rock of Gibraltar. 
steamed out of the Andalusian mountains and leave Spain for a visit to England's famed Rock of Gibraltar. Gibraltar stands like a fortress, the gateway to the Mediterranean. A stubborn little piece of old England, it's one of the last bits of a British empire that at one time controlled a quarter of the planet. The rock itself seems to represent stability and power. And as if to remind visitors that they've left Spain and entered the United Kingdom, international flights land on this airstrip which runs along the border. Car traffic has to stop for each plane. Still, entering Gibraltar is far easier today than back when Franco blockaded this border. From the late 1960s until the 80s, the only way in was by sea or air. Now, you just have to wait for the plane to taxi by, and Bob's your uncle. The sea once reached these ramparts. A modern development grows into the harbor, and today, half the city is built upon reclaimed land. Gibraltar's old town is long and skinny, with one main street. Gibraltarians are a proud bunch. Remaining steadfastly loyal to Britain, its 30,000 residents vote overwhelmingly to continue as a self-governing British dependency. Within a generation, the economy has gone from one dominated by the military to one based on tourism. But it's much more than sunburned Brits on holiday. Gibraltar is a crossroads community with a jumble of Muslims, Jews, Hindus, and Italians joining the English, and all crowded together at the base of this mighty rock. With its strategic setting, Gibraltar has an illustrious military history, and remnants of its martial past are everywhere. The rock is honeycombed with tunnels. Many were blasted out by the Brits in Napoleonic times. During World War II, Britain drilled 30 more miles of tunnels. The 100-ton gun is one of many cannon that both protected Gibraltar and controlled shipping in the strait. A cable car whisks visitors from downtown to the rock's 1,400-foot summit. From the top of the rock, Spain's Costa del Sol arcs eastward. And 15 miles across the hazy strait of Gibraltar, the shores of Morocco beckon. Now this is really quite an amazing spot. The way I understand it, this is the only place on Earth where you can stand right there and see two continents and two bodies of two big seas. We got Africa ahead of us. We got Europe, where I am. On the left, you've got the Mediterranean. And to the right, you've got the Atlantic. And it all comes together there. And when big bodies of water and when big tectonic plates of land come together, there's action. There's action with in the sea. You got um, the water comes together. It makes the confused sea a bunch of riptides. You got the little food, you got the seagulls, you got the little fish, you got the bigger fish, you got the, the, the fishermen coming there. And then when the two uh, bodies of, uh, of land come together, it's like um, two cultural tectonic plates, really. You got Islam in Africa, you got Christendom in Europe. In 711, the Moors swept through from Africa, crossing the strait and taking over much of Spain, and they stayed there for seven centuries. Then all of Christendom ganged up together and pushed the Muslims back into Africa. 1492, that was when they finally pushed them back into Africa out of Gibraltar. And to this day, you've got Islam and Christianity facing off right here. And that causes stimulation, like two tectonic plates rubbing together and you get earthquakes. Uh, you got cultures rubbing together and you get cultural earthquakes. It's fertile, it's exciting. It's progress, it's dangerous, it's challenges, it's war. It's really what history is all about. To stand there and to be aware of that is quite an interesting experience. Now, we're gonna meet the apes of Gibraltar. And I had a mission to get them to wave the British flag. And I was playing around with them and they grabbed my bag because I had an apple in my outer pocket. And he didn't know that my passport was in my bag. And I was so worried about my passport, but I was always so worried about getting rabies if they bit me or scratched me and had to decide, what do I care about more? Not getting rabies or my passport. So I let him take the bag. Thank goodness he got the apple. He left my bag and I did not lose my passport. These cliffs and those over in Africa created what ancient societies in the Mediterranean world called the Pillars of Hercules. For centuries, they were the foreboding gateway to the unknown. <laughs> Descending the rock, whether you like it or not, you'll meet the famous apes of Gibraltar. 
200 of these mischief makers entertain tourists. And with all the visitors, they're bold and they okay. get their way. Yeah, you can have it. You can, you can, you can. Here on the Rock of Gibraltar, the locals are very friendly, but give them your apples. Legend has it that as long as these apes are here, the British will stay in Gibraltar. All right. Hey, Julianne, I think that was a pretty darn good swing through England, finish, finishing with a little sunshine in the south of Spain. I think we got time now for some questions. We do have a lot of great questions, but first, could we have a word from our sponsor? Well, I would love to share a word from our sponsor. And today, our sponsor is the Thanksgiving spirit of making sure when we say thanks for how richly blessed we are, that we're mindful of people who are less blessed and who are struggling and who are hungry, because a lot of people on our planet right now are hungry. 10% of humanity, 800 million people are trying to live on less than $2 a day. That's what we call extreme poverty. And the United States is the richest country on this planet, and we can do a lot. We are doing a lot. We can do more to help fight hunger. And what I do, my major philanthropic initiative every year is raising a million dollars for an advocacy organization called Bread for the World. An advocacy organization in more blunt terms is a lobby organization. It's experts about world hunger and development aid that lobby in the interest of hungry people, both in our country and abroad in Congress. And they make a world of difference. They get billions of dollars of more aid than we would get if they didn't have a place at the table. And you can look at that as love your neighbor, or if you don't care that much about your neighbor, you can look at that as self-serving investment in stability and peace and affluence, because we need to get rid of the desperation on our planet by cutting back on the obscene gap between us privileged ones and those people who will never see their name on a plane ticket. So here's what I do. Every Thanksgiving, I challenge people to collectively match me. I'm gonna give, and this has been a miserable year for me, I've done nothing but lose money all year long, but this is so important to me that I'm just committed to this. I'm gonna give half a million dollars if everybody else can collectively, if 5,000 people can give $100 each. And in, to help inspire you to get on board, we did it last year and we'll do it this year. We've got a challenge and it's, uh, uh, you give $100, I'll give $100 and Bread for the World gets $200. And they invest it in encouraging our government to have policies that are mindful of hungry people, both at home and abroad. And if you can do that, I'd love to thank you, not only by matching your $100, but by giving you these three gifts. This is my uh, one hour Christmas special in a, in a handy little giftable package. You've got all of my favorite pieces of music that we recorded while we were producing our Christmas song all across Europe. And we've got the book that I wrote while I was frustrated by not being able to put all this information into the TV show. This is celebrating traditional Christmas all over Europe. Those three gifts are yours as a thank you. I'm giving the gifts, I'm paying for the postage, and I'm matching your donation dollar for dollar. If you'd rather not have the Christmas gifts and have all of the TV shows we've ever made, you can choose the 20 year anthology, 17 discs, 60 hours of travel fun, all years. If you can get on board with us and together we can empower Bread for the World with a million dollars and that will make a huge difference. It's no overstatement when they brag that for every dollar they invest or we invest in their work, they raise a hundred dollars for hungry people. For me, it's the best way to leverage my philanthropic giving. Julianne has put a link in the chat section and you can go direct to Bread for the World and you could make that donation. You can go to ricksteves.com slash bread and you can find it or you can go to the bread.org website and donate. But this is an organization that I've, I've, I've supported and I've been a part of really for 20 years. And if you'd like to make a difference this Thanksgiving, a lot of people are doing a lot of nice things. This is huge and this will make Thanksgiving a time when a lot of people, ha, a lot of people will be very thankful. So I hope that you can consider that challenge. And I hope that I can find 5,000 people to give 100 bucks. So this will be a very expensive and a very happy Thanksgiving for me. OK, now let's have some questions. Thank you, Rick. Our first question is from April, and we saw so many beautiful walks today. And she was wondering, do you have to stay on the paths or can you 
wander off a little bit to have a picnic or something in the grass? Oh, you know, there's a, a thing about England. They are very adamant about nobody can stop walkers from walking. Mm. It is the right people have. In fact, there's a, a very venerable organization called the Ramblers Club or something like mm -hmm. that, the Ramblers. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've got the Mountaineers, they got the Ramblers. And, um, you know, every year or something, they have what they call a mass trespass. And that's where they go out in mass and they assert their right to walk everywhere. And if a landlord has put up a fence without a gate, they will overcome that fence one way or another and remind that landlord that you've got to let people walk by. So of course, you've got to respect the rights of landlords and not mess up their, their land, but you can walk through it. And when we're walking, England is mostly privately owned, but you can walk everywhere. And that's why you find so many of those charming fences. Wow. I love that. I love walking, especially that English countryside. Oh, beautiful. I'm dreaming about it, Julia. Yeah. I'm just dreaming about it. I just did the Alpine hike and that was great, mm -hmm. but, but uh, the English hike would be a lot more gentle and there's a lot mm -hmm. of pubs and a lot of charm and a lot of beautiful trails from, True. from Land's End to John O'Groats. <laughs> Do that whole trail next. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, our next question comes from Catelyn and she was wondering when you watch previous episodes of Rick Steves Europe and you're listening to the script, um, are you always happy with it? Or are there sometimes times when you wish you'd said something different? It's so funny you say that because I love the on camera where I was standing at the base of that chalk. And mm -hmm. I was saying the sailors looked there and they called it the uh, seven dancers or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then I made the joke that, you know, this, this chalk, you'd have to be really drunk and really desperate and, and, and really groggy to think of that as lace. Yep. But then I thought, no, it should have been not lace, but the lace of women's dresses. Mm -hmm. And then it would have been a more impactful on camera. So mm -hmm. I rethink my, my wording sometimes. And once it's done, it's done. And I just kind of kick myself for not having gone over that with Simon, my producer, a little more thoughtfully. We do our best, but we never get it. We never nail it perfectly. And that's the fun of this work. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I just, you know, I, it takes six days and a lot of time, a lot of energy and a lot of money to produce these shows. And um, we did them all in the old days when things were square and standard deaf. And then we redid them all in modern times with widescreen and high def. And uh, I think uh, we're not going to redo them again. So I'm going to live with the, uh, with the shows that we did. But we are very careful to make the shows timeless. We're very, Simon will always say, do you really want to say that? Because 10 years from now, that might not hold up. And thanks to that, the shows do hold up really well. And I'm looking at these shows and the shows we're seeing today, some of them are a few years old. Some of them were well over a decade old. And I think they hold up very well. Mm -hmm, I agree. And thankfully, the viewers, we always love it no matter what. So <laughs> I don't think we're critiquing the script. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's yeah. a fun challenge. It's just for yeah. me as a tour guide, it's the ultimate gig. I mean, I get, mm -hmm. I, I, I'd love to be on the bus holding microphone, but when I'm talking into the microphone with the TV work, I've got a much bigger tour. Yeah. And we also saw some beautiful Gothic buildings today and structures and the ceilings at um, Cambridge and Oxford. I know you went to the University of Washington. Did you ever spend time studying in the um, reading room there in the Suzalo Library? Suzalo Library. Mm -hmm. I lived in that thing. It's funny you ask. Yeah. I, I would go there. I was a piano teacher and mm -hmm. I never had any time to do my homework in the weekdays mm -hmm. because I went home from school every day and I taught, I taught 10 piano, 10 students for five hours every afternoon and evening, Monday through Thursday. And then Saturday, I'd go to Suzalo Library. And I, I, I remember I would never see any light. I'd go there when it was dark and I'd come out of there when it was dark. And I did mm -hmm. all my studies for the weekend. But that is a gorgeous building. And I think it's called University of Washington Gothic or something like that. But mm -hmm. it feels like Oxford and Cambridge in so many ways. Mm -hmm. We've got some beautiful architecture on campuses here in America. Mm -hmm. I do know I used to work in that library. I know one fun fact about the chandeliers in the reading room. They're actually flipped upside down because their original way of hanging wasn't enough light. So they flip them. And if you look at ah. pictures, you can tell. So it's kind of a I'll look at that next time. Fact. That's a yeah. fix. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, let's see. Our next question is from, um, let's see, from Todd. And he's wondering, can anyone go to the libraries at um, Oxford and Cambridge? Or do you have to be on a tour or something or a student? It varies from college to college. Some mm -hmm. colleges are more private. Other colleges are more um, interested in monetizing. Mm -hmm. And other colleges are just simply more hospitable. So, um, you know, you'll learn your guidebooks, your local tourist information office, the little signboards at the, at the gate will tell you. Uh, some of them you need to go on a tour. Some of them are fairly expensive to get into and others are just wide open, uh, but nothing's prohibitive. And what I recommend is taking a guided walk from the tourist office in both Oxford and Cambridge, you have those walks. I'm a big fan of walking tours in Britain, especially. And these are really great. They're almost free. 
and mm -hmm. they get you places you can't get otherwise, and you understand why things are what they are. Uh, it's just a huge benefit when you go to Oxford or Cambridge to spend two hours with a local expert on a guided uh, walk, and then consider going back to uh, one or two colleges and taking one of their walks of their own campus, which would be quite insightful. Mm, yeah, that's great. And we'll have one last question ending on a lighter note. Um, Frances was wondering, we saw a lot of Southern England today on the coast, and she said she had a lovely time on the Isle of Wight. And she was wondering, have you ever been to the Isle of Wight? If it wasn't too dear. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta say that. <laughs> Julianne, you're showing your age. When I'm 64. Uh, when I'm 64. Um, the Isle of Wight, if it's not too dear. Um, all over England, you find yourself singing Beatles songs. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of fun. Uh, I went to the Isle of Wight. And I thought it'd be a nice, charming place to go if you're an English person looking for some sunshine. You know, it's in the sunny part and it's just off the south coast. It's, it's okay. But if you've got less than a month in England, the, the last place I'd spend any of that time is on the Isle of Wight. It's for uh -oh. English people mm -hmm. having, um, I mean, read, read the lyrics to when I'm 64 and that's, that's what they would be doing. You know, the yeah. great place for grandchildren on your knee. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hey, this, I, this has been so much fun to get together with everybody. Thank you so much, Julianne, for moderating today. And um, thanks to Gabe for answering all of your uh, questions and helping out behind the scenes. I want to remind you, Monday Night Travel, every Monday we get together. We're a family of travelers and we celebrate the world. We share our passion for travel. Next week, is an, for me, it's an exciting week because I get to share with you all the fun traveling I've done this fall. Mostly it's going to be about hiking around Mount Blanc. I had the greatest time. One of the greatest travel experiences of my life, to be honest, having a break from COVID, spending seven days walking 60 miles all around Mount Blanc. And I'm going to share with you how I did that next Monday, a week from tonight. And I'll also share with you the, the travels I did just a couple of weeks ago when I was leading one of our groups. It was a busload doing our, our Heart of Italy tour. And filling that bus was a lot of our new guides. It was a guides mentor tour. And they were all professional guides. They knew what they were doing. They're fine guides, but they had yet to drink the Rick Steves Kool-Aid. And I wanted to make sure that they knew what distinguishes a Rick Steves tour from a regular tour in Europe. And boy, did we ever learn that. I'll show you that. And then we're going to meet the TV crew. And we're going to go from Florence to Rome to Athens, filming the most sumptuous, exquisite art you can imagine. I've actually had a pretty good fall of traveling in spite of the pandemic, and I'd love to share that with you. So that's next Monday. And then after that, we're going to go to underground Europe. And then we're going to, our last show of the year is going to be December 13, when we celebrate Christmas. And I'll take you to several different countries around Europe as we get into the Christmas spirit. And that is Monday, December 13th. Then we'll take a break until January 3rd, and we'll kick off 2022 with a humdinger of a show. All right. So thanks so much. And let's finish off doing what we do really well. And that's called screwing up while the camera is rolling. It's time for bloopers. Whoopee. Uh, your one finger looks like it's cut off if your forefinger. Oh, yeah, 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 it's better. <laughs> and today, Canterbury Cathedral, seat of the Archbishop of Cathedral. Did my, my thing just fell down. I hope you've enjoyed our look at all these little bugs that are flowing around. They don't, we don't see them. But they bother me, okay. I hope you've enjoyed. <laughs> okay. Just hang on another one. Hmm. Simon, will you eat this, please? Things I do for you. <laughs> you can see a Janet with two black eyes. <laughs> it's a pirate's punch of Celtic culture, legends of smugglers. Ah, calm it down, okay. <laughs> and you'll still find cannibals in the houses today. Holy shit. That was good. Little less arm swing, yeah. <laughs> good night, Julianne. Good night, Rick. Hey, good night, Gabe. Good night, Rick.
he's connecting to audio. <laughs> <laughs> Good night, Gabe. Good night.